Great. Well, thank you for joining everyone. Welcome to the first session of the BITS Fall 2023 Research Transparency and Reproducibility Series. We are so delighted that you could join us today. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Grace Hahn. I'm the program manager for the Berkeley Initiative for Transparency in the Social Sciences. Um, if you're new to BITS or it's been a while since you've engaged with us, we were established in 2012 to improve the credibility of science by advancing transparency, reproducibility, rigor, and ethics in research. Um, we primarily do this through three pillars, which is generating evidence about problems and solutions in open science, um, increasing access to open science education through training such as this, as well as other seminars and workshops that we host, and strengthening the scientific ecosystem um, by developing open science policies, protocols, and platforms that enable open science at scale. Um, and some of our later sessions in this training will go over those platforms. Um, I want to mention that this series is generously supported by the Templeton World Charity Foundation, um, and it's a very unique condensed online version of our flagship research transparency and reproducibility training, or what we call RT2, which is typically held over three days in person in Berkeley. Um, RT2 brings together leading researchers from across the social sciences to deliver modules on threats to research credibility and reproducibility, improve research design specification, and various other tools for ethical and open research. Um, this fall, we're very excited to have four online sessions in the series. Today's will be led by the BITS faculty director, Ted Miguel, on the scientific ethos, misconduct, and transparency. Um, and we will have three more, one on November 16th on managing personally identifying information and sensitive data sets, uh, led by our colleagues at the California Policy Lab, on November 29th, we'll have a session on the intersection between data and sh data sharing and code, um, version control and best practices with GitHub, led by our BITS project scientist, uh, Fernando Hoses. And on December 13th, our last session will be about using the social science reproduction platform, as well as the social science prediction platform, um, led by Fernando Hoses and Nicholas Otis, who is a PhD student here at the Haas School of Business. Um, so please register to any other sessions that you're interested in, I will put a link to the registration form again. Um, and yeah, we're excited to kick off today's session. Um, I will pass it over to today's speaker, Ted Miguel. Thanks a lot, Grace. Uh, if you could give me screen sharing, then I will go ahead and, and uh, share screen. Thanks for that introduction. And it's great to see you all. Wish. Uh, we could all be in person, but it's great to um, be able to connect in this way. Um, let me see if I can share screen now. All right. Um, can you guys see my screen? All right, amazing, thanks. Um, so uh, as Grace mentioned at BITS, we work on a bunch of different topics uh, around improving the really integrity and credibility of scientific research. Um, what I'm gonna to do today is give really an overview uh, of some of the principles and ideas that motivate our work and that have been important in uh, the research transparency and op open science uh, movement. And then some of the other sessions in uh, this series, we'll get into more of the details about some uh, practical um, uh, applications and tools that people can use. So I'll be focusing on the scientific ethos, misconduct and transparency and uh, again, this is a lecture that I've given to kind of open our, our more elaborate in-person multi-day RT2 courses in the past. I'm really excited to get your, your thoughts uh, and reactions today. I will say, since we're especially a cozy kind of uh, not too large group, please feel free to interrupt, put comments in the chat, unmute yourself, um, because it could be a pretty interesting conversation. Okay, so just a little bit of background uh, on myself. I'm a development economist. I'm based here at UC Berkeley in the Department of Economics. I'm also affiliated in uh, the departments of agricultural and resource economics and also demography. And I, I work with different types of data, both experimental and non-experimental and non -experimental data. My main research focus is on African societies and, um, and, and a range of different topics. So I'm, I'm really keen to um, you know, share some of my thoughts here and, and just excited to hear your perspectives uh, given where you're coming from. So a little bit of background on uh, the overall RT2 roadmap um, at different training sessions and you know, in different years, we, we often uh, cover a pretty wide range of topics. Again, in the four uh, lecture series this fall, the virtual series, 
we're going to cover a subset of these topics. Um, but what we list here, and it's sort of too much to go through in, in, in much detail, are a range of the different key issues in research transparency training in open science that are important for uh, social science researchers, health science researchers, and others uh, these days. And, uh, you know, we've kind of portrayed this, at, you know, in terms of the life cycle of research. There's certain things that uh, folks would do up front when they're planning a study. Those are in blue in the top. Um, other things that they would uh, do kind of throughout uh, while they're collecting data, while they're, they're carrying out analysis. Uh, and, and those are in yellow. And then there's, you know, the, the kind of steps in red, which relate to publication, reporting issues. So there's really a, a whole bunch of different practices that complement each other and reinforce each other to make research more reproducible and to make the, the scientific process more open. So um, this is just to give you a bit of a teaser, but again, in the other uh, lectures in this series and then in our other uh, you know, more elaborate multi-day in-person courses, we'll often cover many of these, these topics. Um, what I wanna start with again today is discussing where these ideals come from, where open science ideals come from. And I'm gonna start with um, a very famous treatment of what makes up uh, the norms of science and scientific research or the ethos of scientific research. And this is work by uh, Robert Merton published in the 1940s. So it's pretty old at this point. It's a very uh, influential piece of research. It's been cited uh, 11,000 times on Google Scholar. So if you ever check out Google Scholar, you know that that's a pretty impressive number of, uh, of citations. Uh, and I'm really just saying that to, to give you a sense of the influence of this this perspective, Merton didn't see himself as um, sort of inventing these ideas about the norms. He saw himself uh, capturing and uh, recording the norms that he observed to exist in the scientific research process. So, um, you know, the, it isn't like these norms only date to 1942. It was more like in 1942, a researcher was looking around and um, Kind of summing up and 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 bringing together the norms that he said had existed for a long time in scientific research. So, the basic idea of Merton's work, and Merton is a was a very famous sociologist, was an understanding of the scientific research process as being embedded in institutions, in social norms and social structures, and really being a kind of self reinforcing system of beliefs, actions, and uh, and norms. So. He sums this up in, in the quote I have at the bottom of the, the slide here that he thinks these scientific norms don't just bind behavior because they're efficient at, say, producing good science, but they're also viewed by scientists as being the right norms and being good norms. There's a kind of moral prescription beyond just sort of technical benefit to these norms. So I think that's a pretty interesting way to, um, to think about them. And I think for all of us who are active in the research world, a lot of what he writes uh, you know, will really resonate with us in terms of how we see good science. So let me get into a little bit of, of what these norms are. We'll talk about them in turn, and then I'd very much love to, to open it up for conversation and get people's reactions uh, here. So the four core values, which I'll go through, are universalism, communality, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism. So we'll go through those uh, one at a time. And he says, these are really the four pillars that um, support this overall scientific ethos or the way you know uh, science is done. Other people have speculated about where this culture of science or these norms around science come from. There's obviously many different sources, but there are some pretty interesting links into the past, especially into medieval European universities and monastic scholars. Uh, not all these norms, but some of them come from that tradition. Of course, a lot of the early Western universities flowed out of the monastic tradition directly. I mean, a lot of the early universities were training, um, you know, religious scholars. So uh, maybe it's not too surprising that this is this is part of the origin of these um, these norms. All right, the four pillars that Merton focuses on will be my focus today. But there really are a, a wider <laughs> range of issues that we. Oh, does someone have a comment? Oh, maybe not. Um, there are other dimensions of research ethics that are important, other aspects of open science that, uh, that, are, that are all important. 
Uh, and let me mention a few here. I'm not going to focus as much on them here, but maybe they'll come in in the discussion and they're all super important. Um, you know, an issue that matters a lot to us in social science research and health research, but that Merton didn't focus on in his treatment of science was issues around the ethical treatment of, of human subjects or animal uh, subjects. Those of us who do collect our own original data will go through institutional review boards to make sure that our processes for collecting data are ethical. Uh, and this is really a very active area of debate and discussion in the social sciences and in um, the health sciences. You know, what types of uh, protections, what types of processes are uh, make research ethical, especially when dealing with vulnerable populations, with poor populations, uh, with populations in humanitarian settings, um, with older, or you know, populations or those who are sick. There's a lot of, of uh, ethical issues that come into play. Again, they won't really be my focus here, but they're super important. Um, BITS is starting to do some work with partners around the issue of our ethical responsibilities as researchers to return research findings to participants. Uh, and that's a step that is often missing in a lot of research and economics and other social sciences, but um, could be very important. So that's one broader issue. A second broader issue is, are issues of appropriate behavior within research teams, among colleagues, students, faculty, um, research staff, et cetera. Uh, those are obviously you know, critical for the success of science and, and to make sure that science is done in the right way. They won't be as much my focus uh, today. Another issue which will be you know, relevant for Merton's norms, but I won't dwell on a, a ton today, are, are unethical issues like outright fraud. Um, it's going to be relevant to Merton's norms because the practices he talks about can constrain fraud in many ways, or at least they, we hope they would. Um, but I'm not going to kind of dwell on cases of fraud. When we talk about open science, often there, you know, the, the, the cases that get a lot of attention, the very high profile cases are, are cases where there is blatant fraud. And there have been a number of high profile cases like this in the last decade in many large social science fields from psychology to political science and others. Um, there's been even just recently some very high profile cases in social psychology and behavioral economics that have gotten uh, a lot of attention. So those issues are important. I'm not, again, I'm not gonna dwell on them, but maybe in the discussion we can get into how the scientific ethos can constrain uh, that kind of behavior. All right, so this is just to give you kind of a, a broad take on where, where we're going. And I'll jump into the first norm that Merton um, discusses, which is universalism. So universalism uh, can be defined as uh, uh, you know, a, a principle that the acceptance of claims, so our, our view that a scientific claim is true or not, should not depend on the personal or social attributes of the protagonist, that the science is fundamentally impersonal. Um, so you know, what was he getting at with this point? I think the point here is to say, look, if there's a mathematical proof, the proof is correct or wrong, regardless of whether the person who did the proof, uh, regardless of their gender, their racial or ethnic background, their social standing, the science stands on its own. The proof stands on its own. Similarly, if there's statistical analyses and we're concerned about the validity of results or the quality of the research design, it shouldn't matter if I'm you know, tall, short, born in the US, born in Sub-Saharan Africa, et cetera, that shouldn't determine the validity of the science. Um, so uh, in that sense, you know, the research findings are fundamentally impersonal. They derive from the value of the science and not just my identity and my social identity. I can't make a mathematical proof correct just because I say it's right and I'm a powerful person. That isn't how science works. Um, and so you know, the idea here uh, I think is pretty profound. Um, and can create tensions. So, you know, for instance, if we are embedded in a culture, as we often are, where people from different social backgrounds don't have equal rights and don't have equal voice and say, um, science is subject to strain. What if there are findings and insights delivered by someone from a social group that's disadvantaged or discriminated against or outcast? Um, the scientific community, based on this ethos, should still accept their results as equally valid. Uh, just depending on the quality of the science. Um, so, you know, fundamentally, this is a claim that there shouldn't be discrimination in science against any individual uh, people. 
uh, science should be open to people of talent from all backgrounds and not just restricted to certain groups. It isn't that only certain social groups can tell us the truth about science. The scientific process is, is open. So, you know, he's very much making a link between an open democratic society with equal opportunity and scientific progress. If everybody can contribute to science and it doesn't depend, depend on your social identity, excluding certain groups from participating in scientific careers will slow down scientific progress because we won't be learning from, uh, from those individuals. So this is a, a pretty interesting point. And there's a lot of illustrations uh, we can come up with in our own society in the US and many other societies where um, there has been this tension between social standing or social discrimination and scientific progress. So I'm just bringing one up, one example up here, the case of David Blackwell, who is a professor of mathematics uh, at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, David Blackwell was born in a period where there was extreme legal discrimination against African-Americans. He, he was African-American, born in Illinois. Um, his educational opportunities were limited in certain ways early on, but he was a mathematical genius. So by the time of by the time he was age 15 or 16, I forget exactly when, he was enrolled in the University of Illinois and was already a prodigy, um, a, a mathematical prodigy. Um, he uh, had certain, uh, again, educational opportunities denied to him. He couldn't take a position up in Princeton at that time in the, in the 40s when he finished his PhD because he was black, uh, eventually came to Berkeley. Berkeley did hire him. He became a tenured faculty member and actually became the first African-American inducted into the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. He made fundamental contributions to statistics and applied math that we draw on today in the social sciences and game theory um, and various branches of applied math. So uh, an incredible contributor to science who um, in the period in which he lived had his path to participating in scientific research uh, really limited in some ways because of his social identity. And maybe if he had been born even a few years earlier, never would have uh, you know, been able to even finish a PhD in math and go on to become uh, a researcher. So this is just one example, but there's so many other uh, examples, you know, related to gender discrimination, religious discrimination, caste discrimination, et cetera, uh, where people are locked out of science and can't uh, participate. But this goes against the scientific ethos of universalism. It doesn't matter what your social standing is. What matters is the science uh, for scientific progress. So that's that's the first uh, the first pillar. So I'm just going to kind of open it up for a few discussion questions just to kind of warm things up a little bit and ask people what they think more broadly about the relationship between research transparency and broader inclusion or diversity initiatives in science. Are these um, kind of ideals that go together a bit like the universalism um, principle that, that Merton writes about? Are they in tension in some ways? Um, does promoting inclusion and diversity lead to more transparent science? Does more open science promote um, DEI ideals. So let me just pause there and see if folks have ideas and maybe thoughts about where they coincide, where there's tension. I see a hand up. Hey, Alessandra. So, uh, so let's do an example. For example, I'm following right now the sessions that have been canceled by the American Anthropological Association. I don't know if the people here, um, if the people here are familiar what happened, there was a session that should have, is, the American Anthropological Association is like the economic one. They have yeah. their mega conference and there was a session on gender and sex. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with some people, it, it was a very varied conference yeah. and, and at the at the last it was first accepted and then at the last minute it was cancelled mm -hmm. because they claimed it was going against this principle uh, because it's because they were afraid it was not uh, inclusive enough mm -hmm. These people are all scientists. They just have different opinion about sex and gender, what is going on right now. So the conference being canceled, a big deal out of the canceling of this session. So there is going to be maybe even today, 
it's going to be hosted in a place called uh, an Orthodox Academy where these okay. are legitimate. So that is the thing. Okay, what's the, and what's the question? And, <laughs> and the question Go ahead, is, tell me what, get, get to your, what's the question? What, where, what do you, you, you feel like there's a tension between, yeah. inc you're saying inclusion yeah. and the yeah. science yeah. there? Yeah. Okay, I see, got it. Um, I don't know that case, so I'm not gonna wade into and kind of take a stance on it, because I don't know, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued. And if you could even put in the chat a link for yeah. an article, I think after this session, I'd love to read about it. So thank you so much for raising it. Um, but if I'm understanding what you're saying, you're saying there was a fear that this session wasn't sufficiently inclusive, but maybe led it to be canceled. And so you're saying that that may be like restricting scientific debate. So you're feeling like maybe there's a tension between the scientific debate and this desire to be inclusive. Okay. So that's, I think that's, that's a very uh, interesting one. I look forward to learning more about it. I mean, uh, so that, that would be one case. Gufran, do you have another example or thought? Yeah, I was just thinking about the kind of research questions that get asked depending on who is asking them. So if there are certain groups that are systemically marginalized and excluded from the research process, then there are certain important questions that are important for them that probably don't get asked ever. I see. So that would be more, I think, in line with maybe Merton's view of saying, hey, if certain groups can't do scientific research, they're excluded we're not gonna hear their voices and we're not gonna make progress on important issues. And certainly there's been a lot of discussion about that in economics, that gender imbalances, lack of representation by people from certain you know, social, racial, and ethnic groups has led certain issues to be overlooked uh, for too long. So I think that would kind of be in line uh, and maybe a bit of a different view than Alessandro. So this is pretty interesting. There could be cases where inclusion leads to more progress, the case she gave is one where maybe an attempt to be inclusion led to sort of maybe less scientific debate. Uh, another example that often comes up in discussions around DEI issues and um, open science are issues around access to open science practices. So for instance, if it's the case that adopting open science practices like the ones I'll talk about in a few slides takes time and resources and money, could it be the case that uh, scholars at uh, less well-funded institutions or early stage scholars or scholars from disadvantaged groups will have less ability to adopt these practices. And so there's a fear sometimes that, you know, mandating new open science practices could kind of exclude people who are not from the best resourced countries or universities. So I'll come back to that issue um, later on. And uh, but anyway, those those are great great comments speaking to the, the the fact that there may be some tensions between these ideals, and it may not always kind of work the same way that you know that Merton um, hypothesized. Okay, um, there'll be several other discussion uh, you know points, and and thanks so much for the for the contributions. Okay, the second principle in Merton's discussion of science is what he calls communality, um, and communality is really the notion that scientific findings and data belong to the scientific community as a whole and don't just belong to the people who uh, you know, collected the data or, or carried out the analysis. In other words, it's a collaborative endeavor and we need to share to make progress. So this is something that's good for scientific efficiency. Sharing, communicating is critical for us all to, to learn from another, one another. Um, but it's also, there's a kind of moral prescription around it, that it's wrong to sort of hoard data or, uh, you know, not contribute your results to the community as a whole. So the way he puts it here is secrecy is the antithesis of the norm. Full and open communication is its enactment. And, you know, he makes this, this claim that communality of the scientific ethos is incompatible with the definition of technology as private property in a capitalist economy. So he's making this point that, you know, if folks in Google are developing all these cool new technologies and they're not sharing them with everybody else because they, you know, they have a patent or they're keeping it uh, to themselves, it's really undermining the scientific ethos. The scientific ethos is about sharing things with the community so we can all make progress together rather than sort of hoarding ideas to make, make money. So there is a tension here. So I think the first pillar on universalism, Merton would say, you know, in a democratic society, that ideal and you know democracy and universalism kind of go together. But here he's saying in a capitalist society, this notion of open data and open sharing is sort of at odds with uh, some 
aspects of a, a capitalist society. So I think for all of us in the social sciences in the last couple of decades, there's been a big rise in data sharing, code sharing, sharing of study instruments, way more than was the case 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. That's really like the enactment of communality. When I generate data, I need to share it with the community. More donors are mandating that. Um, now in some scientific fields, it's still less common. There's been a lot less sharing traditionally in health fields. There's been a lot of concerns about sharing sensitive health data um, than for instance in, in economics. But so there are differences across fields, but the trend in most scientific fields now is towards more openness. Uh, at the same time, there is this difference between academic researchers and say private sector researchers or you know, medical researchers based in a university and those in a pharmaceutical company around how much of what they're doing they're gonna share with the rest of the community. Okay, so this is the second principle. First was universalism, second was communality, really about open sharing. The third is what he calls disinterestedness. So this is kind of a mouthful and for you know folks uh, for whom English isn't, isn't a native language, this is a bit of maybe a strange seeming word, but you know, being disinterested really means being impartial, objective, uh, not having an interest in the results in the sense of trying to profit uh, from the results. So the idea here is researchers should be motivated by the finding the truth rather than their own professional motivations. When I, you know, so, you know, the, the, the claim here is in the scientific ethos, there's a passion for knowledge, idle curiosity, altruistic concern for humanity, and a bunch of other, you know, motives. And he thinks that these sorts of behaviors are, that we find among scientists in the scientific community are not due to the fact that scientists have greater moral integrity as people. It's just that they're operating within this system, this scientific system that encourages these kinds of uh, behavior. So what would be an example of how this you know, would, would matter, this, this, this principle of disinterestedness? Imagine I'm a researcher and I run an experiment, say in social psychology, around the importance of a certain phenomenon on my behavior. And I run the analysis, I collect the data, and it turns out there's a null result. This behavior, this, this intervention that I thought would really change people's behavior had no effect. Now, if it's harder to publish a null result in journals or it's seen as more boring or kind of less exciting than a very statistically significant result, an unprincipled researcher who's really only mo motivated by their professional goals might manipulate the data, change the sub subgroups they look at, maybe even commit fraud to get a result that would advance their career. And this is a, a phenomenon that we've seen in, in multiple fraud cases in social psychology over the last 15 years, 20 years. Um, a disinterested scholar would say, well, this may be good or bad for me professionally, but I'm going to publish the data. I'm going to report things honestly. And that's you know, a central principle. Disinterestedness is really related to honesty and impartiality and not manipulating our data in ways large or small to benefit us professionally. The goal is to tell the truth and deal with the consequences of telling the truth. So this maybe is the pillar that's most closely linked to these issues around fraud that I alluded to before. Although communality and open data and data sharing is as well, because if you're sharing your data and your code with the rest of the community, it's much harder, I think, to commit fraud. All right, the fourth principle is, is really a little bit less tied to the individual and more to the activities of the community, and this is organized skepticism. And the idea here is that for the scientific community to believe in a result, they need to be able to scrutinize the result. They need to be able to critique it and um, have scrutiny have be skeptical about it in order to believe it. They don't take anything in the scientific community on faith. We don't say that, oh, just because this scholar is very famous, I'm gonna believe her results or his results. We need to see the mathematical proof that the mathematician writes to believe it. We need to understand the analysis and see the data to believe it. And related to this is the very core scientific principle of replication. So in hard science fields, in biological science fields, and increasingly in social science fields, we really only have belief in a result when we can replicate it. That could be as simple as rerunning the, the data and the code uh, that were used to generate the results. In the case of physics, different labs will need to rerun an experiment to really make sure 
uh, that the result holds. So, you know, what Merton writes is the activities of scientists are subject to rigorous policing. There's this exacting scrutiny by fellow experts. That's true when we send articles to journals and referees scrutinize it. So this is really critical. You can also see how organized skepticism is pretty strongly connected with some of the other principles. For instance, communality and the sharing of data and ideas is gonna be critical for replication. Without the data and without understanding the details of how the science is done, you can't necessarily reproduce somebody's results. So the different pillars fit together uh, in an important way. I really like the last quote. I think it, it sounds a little bit like old fashioned language, but, but it's interesting here. The scientific investigator does not preserve the cleavage between the sacred and the profane, meaning something that's holy or you know the realm of religion and the realm of life on earth, uh, but really believes that everything requires, uh, you know, everything can be analyzed. They shouldn't have uncritical respect for anything. They should think critically about everything, every claim, and that's at the core of a scientific mindset as opposed to maybe other types of ideologies or. Uh, or mindsets. All right, um, let me um, pause there and see if there's any thoughts or reflections on these fourth principles. Is there like another principle or two that you thought would re were really core to science that just haven't shown up yet? Jessica, do you have, do you have thoughts or reactions? Yeah, I have one um, comment and then I also, I'll look up the link when I get done, but are you familiar with the the more recent paper with like the additional four norms and anti-norms? Yeah, I'm going to show those in a, okay, in cool. a, in a minute. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, when you first introduced the concept of communality, you said something along the lines of like this principle is about sharing results with the scientific community. And I just was thinking that like in absence of perfect adherence to universalism, I think it's important that we as scientists interpret the norm of communality more broadly than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we share our results with the public community as well. Um, mm -hmm. In so far as there are barriers to being a part of the scientific community. That's a great point. Thanks for that. That makes a lot of sense. And in general, even beyond the, the kind of like moral prescription around that, I think from the perspective of science and sort of generating interest in science in the public, support for science, it is really important that scientists aren't seen as this kind of cast of people that are very different than everybody else that no one can understand um, because what scientists are doing really does relate to improve, should relate to improving the lives of the public. So. Um, I think there could be both, both a moral and efficiency argument for that. What other thoughts or reactions do people have about these, these norms before I get to these additional norms that Jessica uh, just alluded to? All right, if there's nothing now, I'll just keep on going and ask the, the question in italics here, which is how closely do researchers conform to these norms and to these ideals? Oh, Kizito, I see a hand by Kizito, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just looking at the the theme on uh, the norm on uh, uh, organized, uh, you know, organized skepticism, and you you did allude to the aspect of uh, the importance of uh, verifiability of results, and I was just thinking that uh, it looks like a number of progress in the science space has also been based on trust that didn't. Do, go back to retrace the lab experiments, mm -hmm. would we have like some degree of freedom around that space of verifiability? You're say, if I'm understanding, Kizito, you're saying that there's increasingly more scrutiny or are you saying that we, we should have more trust or less trust? Maybe I can ask you to re restate it. Yeah, I was just saying that probably there is a possibility of uh, making progress uh, and picking up, um, you know, evidences that already have been verified and built onto it without necessarily going to reproducing the entire process. Yeah, I, I think it's a good point in that reproduction, replication takes effort and time that researchers could be spending on on new, new work or other other projects. So to the extent that you know, the process is set up in such a way that there is a lot of trust in results. And when things 
are when we attempt to replicate them, they successfully replicate consistently, then maybe it's the case that not every result would need to be replicated, that we could base some scientific communication on trust. Um, I think what's happened in the social science fields is over the last 10 or 15 years, as the open science movement has expanded in social science, when there have been efforts to replicate existing results, in a very large share of cases, those replication attempts fail. And that's given, I think, a lot of motivation for us to, to maybe trust a little bit less and, and reproduce and replicate a little bit more. But maybe we will get to the stage in our fields where the, the procedures that are set up, the practices are set up are robust enough that when we do these audits of uh, you know, the verifiability of results, if they really pass the test consistently, then maybe um, there can be more trust in some of those findings. Yeah, thanks for that point. Um, okay, let me tell you a little bit about some data on how we're researchers today line up with these, these uh, codes of conduct or standards of conduct or not. And the, the study I'll talk about, it's a little bit, uh, you know, from about 15, 16 years ago now, but it's a really neat uh, survey. This was a survey of U.S. researchers, so it was a particular population that asked them about how much they personally subscribe to the Mertonian norms, you know, believe in them, how much they personally follow those norms in their own scientific practice, as well as their views of what other scientists uh, are doing. And what's neat about the sample is it was based on US researchers that received NIH funding, National Institutes of Health funding, um, both early and mid-career scholars across a very wide range of fields. Some of them are, are very much in the biological sciences, but there's also a lot of social scientists demographers, sociologists, health economists, who also get funding from NIH. So there's a pretty broad range uh, of scholars and a decent sample size. So this was an attempt to, to measure how people view these norms. And the, the date is pretty nice here because it's sort of just before a lot of movement and energy started regarding research transparency in the social sciences. There's been a lot more activity really in the last 10 to 15 years. So this is almost like what was the status quo before the rise of the open science movement in, in a lot of our fields. Um, and so these are some of the norms, and I think this is a bit what Jessica was alluding to. The first four are Merton's norms that I talked about, universalism, communality, disinterestedness, organized skepticism, but there's also counter norms that could exist. So rather than universalism, particularism, favoring certain types of people. Instead of communality, secrecy, Instead of being disinterested, being self-interested when making choices about one's research. And instead of organized skepticism, organized dogmatism. So kind of belief in a certain idea or theory, but you know, organizing around that theory and really not subjecting it to scrutiny. Um, and then there's a couple of others that have been included in this um, set of beliefs. One is governance. So in other words, the idea that scientists should be responsible for the direction of research versus administration, meaning scientists are just told what to study, what to do by non-scientists. Uh, and the, again, the idea is that autonomy to really explore key scientific issues by the scientific community is critical. Uh, and then the last one is, is a focus on research quality or originality versus quantity. Now, as in, you know, if I think about my economic models, I would say, well, I kind of like quality and quantity. There's nothing wrong with quantity. If you can do lots of high quality research, that's great. Um, but to the extent that there is a trade-off here, uh, the idea that we should focus on quality rather than quantity is important. Sometimes when researchers are assessed, people just count the numbers of papers, but you know, if none of those papers are making much of a contribution, they're not doing much for science. So we really want to make sure, sure that science is making original contributions. All right. So these different principles were asked about the norms and the counter norms to those NIH funded researchers about 20 years ago. What do they say? So, um, oh, before I get to those, just to show you some, some neat acronyms, people have put together the, the norms and the counter norms in nice acronyms. There's the kudos norms. This, these are the Mertonian principles and then the place counter norms which again, you know, are, are kind of you know, in tension with each other. So the question is, are these NIH researchers conforming more to the kudos norms or the place norms, the Mertonian norms or the counter norms? So what do they find? Let me explain this figure briefly. This is reproduced from the Anderson uh, article. 
the light gray shading here is the proportion of people surveyed who said they personally believe in the Mertonian norms. The medium gray is people whose answers are kind of mixed. In some cases, they support the Mertonian norms, some cases the counter norms. And then the very dark gray are, are the share of people who support the counter norms, who just openly say, no, I don't believe in data sharing, I believe in secrecy. Uh, and yes, I'm very self-interested. That's what I think you know, is, is, is a value. So the nice thing here about scholars, whether early or mid-career, is the vast majority, 90% of them, say, yeah, these, these norms, these ideals resonate with me as a scientist. This is what I believe is the right way to do science. So in some ways, this is a very encouraging thing for, um, for the norms and our view of, of science. In addition to what people believe, that subscription to the norm, there were questions asked about own behavior. Here, the story becomes a bit more mixed. Most people, around 70%, still say, yes, I follow these principles in my science, but there's a good 20, 25% of people who kind of follow mixed norms. Sometimes, you know, sharing data, sometimes being more secretive, maybe they're afraid that other people will scoop their results um, and, and, and the like. So the picture is a little bit more mixed. Then they were asked about others' behavior in their fields. How do you think other people are behaving? Now, this, I think, from a data collection perspective is very useful for those of us in development economics like myself. Sometimes when we're asking politically or legally sensitive questions, we do ask people what they think most other people like them do rather than asking directly what they do. So this was pioneered in, in development economics, especially in the field of asking about corruption. So you may not want to ask in a survey a firm, did you pay a bribe in the last year to get, say, public services, even if that's very widespread, because the respondent would be admitting to a crime or admitting to doing something wrong. There could be legal jeopardy for them. So what often is done is people say, well, think about a firm just like yours in your city. In the last year, <laughs> do you think they've paid a bribe? So that's a way of kind of asking about the person without, without doing so. So you know, again, we may prefer in some cases to ask what people think others like them in their field are really doing. Here, the picture is much more bleak. So if you look at, at the picture here, the vast majority of people are saying, you know, we are not conforming to the norms. Uh, maybe it's a mixed picture for some people, but very few people are saying, yes, other people in my field really follow these norms. So there's a gap. There's this dissonance between what people believe in, the scientific values that are important to them, the Mertonian norms, and how at that time they saw their fields, people in their fields behaving. So this is a very stark, uh, stark difference between the 90% and the 10, uh, the 10 percent. So this is what the Anderson folks call normative dissonance or the disillusionment gap. Um, and again, you know, I don't know what the right number is in terms of actual behavior based on that data. Was it the 10% or the 70%? But maybe it's somewhere in between uh, in terms of how many people were behaving according to these, uh, these norms. Um, some other interesting patterns come out of this, um, this study. They did find in their data that researchers based at for-profit organizations were significantly more likely to subscribe to counter norms. Um, so maybe that's not totally shocking. If they were trying to commercialize things, discover things they could profit from, that seems to go kind of directly against the communality norm, sort of just as Merton hypothesized or thought that there was this tension between trying to profit from science and really doing science the right way that benefits the community as, uh, as a whole. And I think there is a concern and a fear, especially for those of us based, say, in the Bay Area, where there's so much commercialization of discovery all the time out of Berkeley, out of Stanford and UCSF and other universities, you know, could it be the case that that drive to commercialize every invention, every new idea um, is eroding scientific norms? I think that's, that's a concern. And there were some smaller differences though in um, subscribing to the norms among folks with PhDs from different countries by gender, but those tended to be um, you know, smaller. The really big difference was this sort of academic versus for-profit um, difference. Um, okay, so, you know, what do, what do Anderson et al. write? They write, persistent mismatches between beliefs and actions can contribute to work strain, disillusionment, alienation. People, you know, want to take the right action, but they're confused, there's ambiguity, 
because they think doing so puts them at a competitive disadvantage. That basically the people who are kind of cheating or the people who are bending the rules, the people who are not as generous in sharing results with others are kind of getting ahead. And the people who are generous and open and following the norms are falling behind. That was the, the concern that came through in a lot of the surveys. And that's a very disturbing view. And really, I think at the time, uh, if you read this article, there's a bit of a, I think, a call to action or a call to greater awareness about this in saying, hey, you know, we may need to change the system. The system is no longer incentivizing people to follow the core scientific ethos. We need to, to change scientific practices and realign them with, uh, with these goals. So, you know, that's the question. How can scientific practice be brought back in line with core scientific values? And then also how severe are these problems in reality? This was just one survey, you know, there could be other, other evidence, but it was, you know, findings like this and this kind of dissonance that helped to motivate those of us who started BITS, that started the Center for Open Science, that started other initiatives to try to change norms in our fields, in social science fields and beyond. And there's kind of parallel movements in medical research that have been around for a few decades as well. Um, so there really is a kind of broad open science movement that, that where there's contributions across fields, we learn from each other. Um, and the last 10 or 15 years has been a period of a lot of, of change. All right. So um, let me just show one more slide and then open it up for uh, discussion. So I'm sure folks have, have thoughts and, and reactions to this. Um, with a team based here at BITS and also colleagues at um, University of Illinois, Chicago, Princeton, um, and UCSD, kind of a, a pretty big team across disciplines, we collected survey data over several years asking researchers about their own practices, their own open science uh, practices. And we focused in the figure I'm showing you here on scholars who had been active researchers since at least around 2010. So people who had been active for a, a relatively long period of time, there's many hundreds of scholars here. We tried to get a fairly representative sample of scholars who were publishing in uh, leading journals. Um, and for this figure, we had scholars from economics, psychology, political science, and sociology. So four of the really big uh, social science fields. And in the survey data, we asked people about current practices, but also their past practices, including when they started sharing data, when they started posting study instruments in a public registry, when they started pre-registering hypotheses in a pre-analysis plan in a public way. Um, and that's really where the data here on time trends comes from, is their own um, you know, work histories about when they adopted these, these practices. And I think one of the encouraging things that comes out of this study, which again was just published a couple months ago, is there seems to be a very strong upward trend in the adoption of a number of different open science practices, posting data and code, posting study instruments, meaning the, the kind of protocols people use, and in more recent years, pre-registration. So pre-registration in the social sciences was basically unknown you know, before 2011 or 2012, but by 2020, over a quarter of the social scientists we surveyed had pre-registered hypotheses. And anecdotally, uh, and, and, and knowing about data on the AEA registry, et cetera, I think these numbers have increased a lot um, in recent years. So you know, from the period that the Anderson et al. study comes from till today, we are in a period of rapid uh, scientific change, change in methods, and open science practices are really becoming much more common than they were, say, a decade ago or 15 years ago. All right, let me pause there for open discussion. Uh, there really, I think, are a lot of themes we could get into. I'm very curious to hear people's, again, thoughts and reactions. Where does this framework fall short? What are things about it that you like? Uh, many people, most people probably on the call are researchers or they're studying to become researchers. What are your kind of thoughts and reactions overall about how this perspective may affect your work? So let me just leave it there. And in the last uh, you know, seven or eight minutes here, hear what people say. Hey, Lucas. Hey, Ted, this has been terrific. I, I wanted to ask you about proprietary data. So should editors and referees be giving preference to, to research that's not based on proprietary data? 
And how do we balance that tension? On the other, on the one hand, I do have colleagues that are learning very interesting things using, for example, proprietary da uh, data from firms, but, but there's a tension there. Thanks for raising that. This is an issue that, in especially in the economic space, where there's been, as you said, just tons of proprietary data use, sometimes from private firms, sometimes government data that's kind of hard to access and that people can't, you can't just post your data online to let people replicate your work. Other researchers would have to go through a whole process in order to do so, which effectively makes it impossible to directly replicate uh, the studies. Um, the statistic that I saw that was shared by the AEA data editor recently was that 40% of papers in the AEA journals, American Economic Association journals, now use proprietary data. So this is a, a first order issue. Um, the response that some of the data editors have been doing are to A, try to obtain the data or try to replicate results, even if it's in a kind of controlled, clean room kind of environment. So even if the replication data won't be posted up on Dataverse or on the AEA, AER website, at least allow replicators to access it or at least send code to the holders of the data to be able to replicate results as a kind of compromise, that's one. Um, and data editors and data replicators are also still trying to scrutinize the, the scripts, the, the code, the computer code, statistical code that goes into analyzing the data to look for mistakes, issues, to try to understand the analyses. So I do think there's a tension there, but I think the hope is that we can still achieve some um, some understanding of how replicable those results are through those methods I just mentioned, um, but it's but it's attention, and you know to the extent that even beyond you know an inability to replicate, maybe only very favored people get access to that data, or maybe only people at the richest, most famous universities can access those data. That also feels unfair, and it also feels like something that would lock a lot of people out of doing good research. So I think that's a big equity concern that relates to our universalism. Principle, but I don't know. Do you have do you have thoughts or reactions? I would only just to add on uh, an an additional fear is that one only a researcher would only receive the data for asking certain types of questions that the firm maybe has an interest in answering. I, I agree. I think I think that's right. I think there's also a fear that to the extent that researchers have a little bit of discretion, like you said, in the questions they ask, how they answer them, the types of analyses they conduct, there can be you know, maybe a little bit of bias that comes in. And some scholars have a certain ide ideological view and may tilt their analysis in that direction. And like you said, maybe the firm or the government would only share the data with people with whom they feel they're ideologically aligned. So I think that's that's a concern. And again, to the extent that others can access the data, even in a controlled environment, it would make me feel much more comfortable about those results. So I think there may over time end up being less trust in the results based on proprietary data because we can't scrutinize them. And I think that would be a very fair you know, response until others can kind of reproduce and replicate some of those findings. What other thoughts and reactions do folks have in the last three or four um, minutes about open issues and concerns? There's, of course, in the open science space, there's dozens of open kind of you know, issues of debate right now. So I don't know if there's any that jump out at people. There's a, a comment or additional question in the chat um, from Alessandra in case. Oh, you okay. Yeah. Let me try to. I didn't see that. I can read uh, it oh, out as well. Yeah. Oh, it was just uh, with oh, respect ahead, to Lucas. Yeah, <laughs> it was just uh, a segue to to Lucas. Uh, you know, because just because these companies give us the data, are they subject to the same ethical principle in collecting the data? Who knows what they give it to us? they definitely have an interest because we have seen that there is interest. So I think yeah. especially data that we with private from company, we should be super careful because I think conflict of interest are at every single step. Plus what yeah. if the researchers get even paid? Exactly. And I think, you know, the point about being paid is, is a great one because that was one of the early steps, for instance, that the AEA took and you may remember, I think it was around 15 years ago that we started having to have disclosure statements when we submitted to journals. And until whatever it was, 2009, mm -hmm. 2010, there yeah. weren't even disclosure statements. So there were people publishing in top econ journals, say on finance, 
using data from a bank and the bank was paying them and no one knew they were paying them. So that feels like the most basic form of ethics in research. The medical journals were like 10 or 15 years ahead of us on that. And I think we copied that correctly. Um, and since then there've been more data sharing requirements and pre-registration. So the policies and practices have changed, but but disclosure of conflict of interest feels like the most basic one. But until recently, we didn't even do it in economics. Um, I see another hand from Pamela. Maybe the last. Uh, maybe the last question. No, mine is just a comment. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Mine is just a comment that, um, for example, there are some institutions where researchers um, need ca capacity development a lot before they can catch up with researchers in like, for example, high income country um, institutions in things like data sharing, openness and so on. So that is the kind of inequality that um, I, I see when I, I, I um, listen to a presentation like this. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point and it's been something on our mind at BITS from the start. You know, partially BITS is a uh, in initiative that's within SIGA, Center for Effective Global Action, which is an international development research center. And so, so many of our collaborators, colleagues are scholars based in low and middle income countries. And this issue has come up again and again, A, there may be less awareness outside of certain, you know, circles of universities in North America or Europe about some of the practices and the tools. We've tried to address some of those issues by funding and supporting training courses globally on these tools. The, but the second one is the resources that are needed. So we need to find ways to make open science practices streamlined, effective, not too burdensome, not too onerous, so they can be employed really you know, broadly by scholars at a wide range of institutions you know, around the world, and they become a standard part of scientific practice rather than just being another thing through which elite researchers set themselves apart from others and it prevents others from publishing. That is, that would be a terrible outcome of the social, of the open science movement, uh, for sure. I think I may be at time, Grace, is that right? Yes, thank you so much for your presentation, Ted. Um, and thank you for all the participants for your engagement and questions. Um, we encourage you to sign up for session two, as well as others in the series. And this session will be, it has been recorded, so we'll share that as well. Um, and of course you can engage with us outside of this call through email. And um, yeah, we'd just love to continue uh, this relationship. But thank you everyone for your time and hope you have a good rest of the day. Great, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.